America is in decline. But what does that look like? Should you worry? And what can we learn from history? Let's talk about it. Beep, 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 beep. There are economic challenges, political divisiveness, social fragmentation. Is the empire in decline? Let's run the clip. Throughout the well-worn pages of history, empires have risen, grown to prominence, and collapsed into the mist of time. The Roman Empire, stretching from the sweltering sands of Africa to the murky woods of northern England. The British Empire and her dominance of the Seven Seas. Radio Shack. All of these and more have become the stuff of legend, each with their own stories of success, expansion, and ultimately, collapse, unable to bear the weight of their inherent contradictions. But are all empires destined to meet this fate? And the question on everyone's mind, probably because it's the title of this video, are we living through the end of an empire? In this episode, we'll take a look at the precarious position of the United States and consider some historic parallels to assess whether the U.S. is really in decline. Boom, Andrew! There was a uh, YouTube page called Second Thought, and they just dropped a viral video. Uh, well, it dropped a little bit ago, but it's got like a million views, and it compares, Andrew, the fall of the Roman Empire to potentially the fall of the American empire. Oh man, don't people love comparing America to Rome? And who's really an expert on it? I don't know, I'm not, but maybe this guy from Second Thought is. Anyways, we're gonna summarize the video, we're gonna break it down, give you our thoughts as reasonably intellectual people who care about America, care about the world. So anyways guys, please hit that like button, check out other episodes of the Hot Pop Boys, and also if you have some time and you're not too caught up in the decline of America, check out The Rise of Small Ass Sauce, smallassauce.com. This is a hot topic right now, Andrew. Newsweek, Time Magazine, countless YouTube pages. I mean, I just did a quick search on the internet and there was even more results than I thought in terms of like, this is a topic that is trending literally this past few couple months. Yeah, it gets it. I think it gets debated uh, a lot. Obviously, it's used to fuel political campaigns. I mean, a lot of people on this side and that side are going to say, oh, that side's ruining America. That side's ruining democracy. That side's like basically we're not really talking about who's to blame, although it may be more of a system thing than an individual thing. But anyways, we're going to get into it, David. So I guess before we get into summarizing the video, what are some quick thoughts? Um, is America Rome? Okay, so you have to look at the Roman Empire. I'm going to just pop up some photos right here. And you have to look at the American Empire or what is considered the American Anglosphere over here. Mm -hmm. uh, both pretty far reaching. Obviously, the American one reaches across the Pacific. Rome was more like hyper localized in that region because they didn't have like airplanes and stuff at that time. Is America like Rome? Um, Elon Musk, Andrew, has actually argued that America is not as expansionist or colonialist as it could have been. Whereas other people say that it just does a partnership satellite state like colonialism in places like Japan, South Korea, Germany, UK, Australia, Philippines. Israel and Taiwan mm. so basically there's some debate over how similar America is to Rome even at the question point right so maybe you guys can let us know those who are a little bit more well versed in this what are your thoughts is America comparable comparable to the Roman Empire or not or obviously uh they were two great empires and, and you know but pretty far apart from each other so let's summarize the video real quick first of all he says let's say it's like Rome what will it follow in Rome's uh, footsteps and crumble. So a lot of people were saying, how did it crumble? Because everybody knows, Andrew, uh, if you remember high school history, it was a great empire that fell apart, right? Yeah, and a lot of people tend to think especially when we read it in the history books, we just read and then the Roman Empire started to decline and then poof, it's gone. Yeah, or Nero, Nero burned it down, right? Right, right. So we just know it as something that happened over a short period of time, happened in one or two sentences in our <laughs> textbooks, right? But basically the video says that it's, it, it kind of fell by a multitude of factors over a couple generations. It wasn't any single one individual leader. It wasn't any single one issue. It wasn't any single even one attack, but it was just a bunch of multitude of factors over time that led to this decline that were not solved. So it's death by a thousand cuts. That's yes, what they're yes, saying. Yes, yes, yes. But he does go on to say that even within that death by a thousand cuts concepts, there are some things that weigh more heavy than others. For example, endless wars bog down the resources, both in a money capital and human capital way. It just takes up 
the focus of everybody's mind. Mm, okay. Then it also says that gratuitous shows of wealth and inequality, they just create like social issues and things like that. Oh, I think America might have a little bit of that going uh, on. America is going through an economic crisis, mismanagement of health crisis. For example, he compares Ovid to Rome having the measles, smallpox, ancient Ebola, and the bubonic plague. Oh, that sounds terrible. Those, Those probably, sound yeah, way uh, worse than COVID. I'm not going to lie. Way worse. Then he goes on to say, America's like to mythologize how a great and blessed by God or whatever larger entity America has been, but the American empire is only 250 years old. The Roman empire is only 500 years, was, was 500 years old. So they're saying it relatively, the Roman empire lasted longer. Also, I do think at that time in history, things moved a little slower. So when you were an empire, you may have stayed an empire for longer versus nowadays, everything is, uh, we're kind of in this microwave Right, era. It, may, it may have taken even like two months to get like a messenger to go over to a far away way land right? right i mean to wage war i mean dudes had to like think about how to plan for like years i'm assuming um he talks about how americans mythologize themselves using manifest destiny and the concept of american exceptionalism mm -hmm. so basically he said that sometimes that makes people a little complacent because they're like man america's exceptional we don't got to worry about these little cracks in the uh, you know, the seams of the baseball falling right. apart. Right, you mean it's kind of like this idea of believing you're invincible, it kind of plays against you. Like, you kind of need to keep up a little bit of insecurity, of healthy insecurity, to say, okay, we can always get better, or we can always do this better, we can always treat each other better. Uh, or you're just never going to see your flaws. Right. Then he goes on to say, what does the end of an empire even look like? People, like you said earlier, Andrew, they tend to think about it in a video game style. Like the empire just crumbles. Oh, like, you mean and no, and, and the buildings crumble. Like this is, uh, this is what people think. He's thinking like the, the video game Age of Empires. Yeah, they think like, uh, when America d is in decline, there's going to be like this huge earthquake and then literally like our towers start to crumble and th it's like, it's not going to look like that. Right, right, right. Because if you look at the, Andrew, the superpowers that came before America, Portugal, Netherlands, AKA the Dutch, then England, those are actually still, well, maybe no disrespect with the exception of Portugal, still pretty great places to live while a lot of people are moving to Lisbon now. But like, you know what I mean? Like, even though they lost the power to project power globally in their agendas globally, it doesn't mean internally they were horrible places to live. It doesn't mean they're ish holes. You know what I mean? Like, like Canada's never been powerful. I mean, you can argue because of America, right. but like it's never, that's always until, I guess you could say maybe until recently, it's been a really great place to live. No, a lot of people would love to still move to Canada. And actually a lot of people would still love to move to America, but there's definitely some issues. So he points out, that there is unaddressed failure points. He said, every empire runs into a lot of issues, but it's about that empire's ability to address and fix the issues. Ah, guys, how do you solve problems? You know what? You know, I'm in a relationship right now. I have a girlfriend, and a lot of what I hear when people talk about relationships is how do you fight? How do you solve problems with each other? That's really important. How do you communicate? And I think... Using that in an American sense, applying it to the American empire, how are we sol solving problems? Are we solving problems? How are we communicating between our opposing parties that, you know, need to agree on certain things to just even get things done? Right, right, right. And he lists crumbling infrastructure, rampant corruption, severe inequality, dwindling trust, and humiliating defeat. That's what he said are the unaddressed failures right now within the American empire. Man, it sounds like a marriage, bro. Um, and he says that, yes, uh, by the way, during the fall of Rome, Andrew, Rome was attacked multiple times by outside groups, but really what did it in was internal supply chain failure. Ooh. So he's, And that so goes to that quote, David. Somebody quoted this thing from, uh, what movie is that? From Oh, from the Avengers movie? From, yeah. from Captain America. An empire toppled by its enemies can rise again. But one which crumbles from within, that's dead. Forever. Boom, Andrew. He also lists that there's global factors that may impact America harder than other places, even though they're impacting everybody, such as the climate crisis. Mm. Um, he also says it's losing economic dominance in the world. He primarily points out to China, 
But he also points out that the, it was the American companies that sold out the manufacturing to China. He also points out, Andrew, the third world, Global South, no longer believes that America is the inherent good guys in any conflict anymore or dispute like they did in the 1980s. Mm. Well, even a lot of Americans question whether America is the good guys. And, and, you and know, people that, used to not question that. Yeah, and that's not really the individual's fault. I think it's a lot of the government's fault for... Uh, Making it seem that way. Right. So he said that the Dems blame Trump for dialing back LGBT and immigration rights. And then everybody blames Biden for funding all these deep state proxy wars that obviously takes America's attention away from internal focus to external focus, right? Well, it's always the other team's fault. David, right. let me tell you this, guys. If you're looking for somebody to blame, it's the other person. Yeah, the other tribe is uh, usually a pretty human answer. Yeah, no, no, no. Whoever's... Not fault it is. It's just not yours. It's the other person's. Right. Anything but self responsibility and accountability. He says, actually, Andrew, these people are just products of an overall system that needs to be reworked. Mm. By the way, this is, we got to be, Andrew, Second Thought is a little bit more what? Of a socialist leaning channel? Yeah. By the way, guys, I've watched multiple Second Thought videos. They're very good, very well informed, very well done. I enjoy watching them. He does support that. Uh, he does think America essentially needs a little bit more socialist systems, uh, which I think there's a good argument for. It also depends on how you implement these things and he does it his reasoning is essentially for the well-being of the citizens right 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 he basically said presidents are just a product byproduct of a system much larger than them they're all just figureheads is like he's basically saying it's like almost like somebody is the mast of a ship but the ship is more important than the little mast of the ship right that little statue at the mm -hmm. front of a ship he says uh all presidents are hyper capitalistic and basically uh all the differences between the political parties are more so aesthetic. However, he does agree that there's differences in social issues between the two parties, but that social issues are much less impactful to the everyday person than economic system frameworks, but everybody's just distracted from looking at shifting the economic frameworks. Right, right. Everybody's saying that these social issues tend to take up space in people's minds and emotions a lot more than the economic issues, which are actually more important to your life, but are also, to be honest, more complicated and less emotional, and therefore people think less about them. Right, so people want to just talk about the emotional things, yes. the, like, like some dinner table type things. Uh, he talks about how the companies keep squeezing everybody and everybody more for money, especially the workers. Mm. Then he talks about how China from a leadership standpoint, has a longer-term plan, you know, even 20, 30, 40, 100-year plans. And literally, since we outsourced all our actual work to them, we should have seen it coming. Basically, China's rise was due to America not wanting to do the work or get the work done for way cheaper. Hey, uh, Billy, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind uh, doing your homework and your school project. <laughs> yeah, I'll Billy, Billy's like, oh, yeah, sure, Tung. Sure, Tung Pao, I'll definitely let you do my work. Tung Pao, you're getting real smart. <laughs> and the teacher's giving you all the credit. What's up with that? Uh, yeah, Billy, uh, I don't know what to tell you. I learned a few things from doing your work. Uh, he also goes on to say that the last thing that America has that is way better than everybody else in the world is the military. And that war, is, war is big business. And maybe people, he believes that people, whether they know it or not, are approving lots of war to give America a shot in the arm to keep it powerful at the top for a few more decades. He said he, it's a America. shot in the arm. Yeah, well, I guess the, uh, yeah, people would say that the wars fuel so much business in America and not just the right, it's the you right business. You print money business. too. You, you print, print money, money you build stuff, you innovate. It's a reason to innovate technologies. It's a reason to keep people in power because during wartime, you don't want to switch leaders. So basically, anyways. So I guess, David- Oh, no, no, and the last what? point. He says, there's nobody alive on earth who remembers a time where the US wasn't on the top of the world. And that leads to entitlement, a pride, and an ego that can make it easy to overlook major issues. My goodness. Uh, well summed up, second thought. Uh, I guess uh, before we get to our own personal takes on this as, you know, I would say uh, concerned citizens that like to see things- But y'all are Chinese! Through an intellectually honest- you. Uh, through an intellectually honest lens, uh, I guess, what are some comments All right, from other people? This guy just said, a lot of comments from non-Americans that are native English speakers. 
uh, or maybe non-native English speakers, to be honest. They, they all, a lot of people learn English nowadays. So he said, as a non-American, I really hope America just becomes a normal country that cares for its own citizens, not bombing farmers thousands of miles away. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Here's the funny thing is, Andrew, sometimes some people on the other like pro-war side, they're like, you don't know how much your daily freedoms require the, the bombings of people that you don't even know about. Right. So that's like the argument on the other side. But yeah, obviously other people are like, eh, it's not that bad to not be able to just bully everybody. Um, point number two, he says, imagine if when Rome declined, instead of just fracturing and resulting in new nations, Rome had the ability to end the planet by attempting to cling on to power, either by consuming so hard that they cooked the place or through spite with a ridiculous, ridiculous arsenal of nuclear warheads. So that was a it, that was like an ominous comment saying like basically this is a, I believe an outside person questioning if the U.S. will fry the world before it gives it up. Um, this person said there's a famous Arabic poem that basically says the nations endure only with their ethics. When the ethics are gone, they too will be gone. And then they said America's fall was always inevitable. Um, of course, you know, a civilization is declined when they blame another country for their own problems, which they created themselves. Nobody told Steve Jobs to move the iPhones to Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. America is like Titanic, too big to turn, too slow to react, too proud to recognize when we already hit the iceberg and not enough lifeboats for anybody. Somebody said, no, you guys are just jealous of the greatest country in world history. Of course, other people are saying that the worst part of this is, is that the solutions to prevent collapse are actually simple, but they just require one, a lot of work, two, for the greed of the powerful to be culled, and three, for a certain part of society to admit that there are problems that need dire solutions. We are so effed. Mm. Um, somebody Another said, one. I've lived in the U.S. my whole life, but over the last few years, only then have I started to seriously consider leaving. Um, somebody said history repeats itself because humans don't learn different era, different countries, same mistakes. And this guy said, what irritates British people is clear that the U S has not learned from any of British Britain's mistakes, bar none. I'm not calling it an empire. Uh. And then of course, Andrew, the last qu comment, the question is whether or not the U S will go at least somewhat gracefully. It, oh, the question is whether or not the U S will go down gracefully or will it will drag the whole world down with it. Mm, guys well i don't know <laughs> the, the, by the way we gotta be be clear here i pulled these comments from second thoughts website second thought is a little bit uh anti-american -imp imperialism sure. so you get a lot of the global people who don't like american imperialism in the comment section right right well let us know what you think about those comments down below so here's kind of how i'd sum it up and here's a way to think about it maybe in terms of the NBA, you know, on the in the comment section, people will be like, hey, can you explain this in NBA terms? In NBA terms, let's just say America is like the Boston Celtics. All right. This what, but, is what, but when? When? Well, particularly between 1959 and 1966, when Bill Russell won eleven championships out of his 13 seasons uh playing on the Celtics. And I think uh that that's when the Celtics were a shining dynasty, right? And then also you had those years with Larry Bird and Kevin McHale. So obviously that came in the 80s. So that was still, uh, you know, quite some time after. But basically after the 2008 championship, there was really nothing about until 2024, until this last championship. And I think that the Boston fans stuck with them, right? Would you say that Boston Celtics kind of stuck with I've franchise. never seen Celtics fans turn on the Celtics. No, they didn't have, they never really trashed them. They were hopeful. They stuck with the Celtics, even though they were like, ah, I don't like how the Celtics are moving. Or, oh, okay, these young players, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, they're just young. They're going to get after it. Uh, they're going to keep working. They really stuck with their team. Now, when you are dominating so hard, and that's all you know, or that's all your generation knows, that any sort of decline feels like the country's going into rubble, right? Right, you're saying any sort of NBA dynasty, when it's in the middle of the dynasty, anything but maintaining the dynasty feels like a fall off. Yeah, when you're in rebuild stage, obviously for a lot of teams, it feels like the team is gonna suck forever. But a lot of people leave their team and are fair weather fans, or a lot of people stick with their team and just believe it and appreciate it because they understand that there are better- So what are you to trying come. to say? We just need to- stick with the team or we need to do something different or what I mean is that America probably could not have gone that much higher in the powers. So 
inevitably there's going to be a dip. You mean from like 1990 America or something yeah. like that? So how deep this dip is, first of all, I think America will, you know, kind of uh, hit, hit the ground and then come back up. There will be a, a rise again, but it's probably in a slight dip. But how deep does that dip go? It kind of depends on a lot of people's, uh, uh, what they do, right? And not necessarily on the citizens, the citizens need to do their job, but the leadership, really. So the leadership has to look at themselves and say, hey, guys, for how many decades are we going to make these decisions that could possibly keep dragging America down? Right. I think that uh, my biggest thing is, like, people need to break free from the old binaries of the old days. Like, if you look at a place like Singapore, Andrew, and I know we always talk about Singapore, right? I get it. It's a really small country. They have some things, Andrew, that would be considered hyper-left and hyper-right about the way they run their society because they're very capitalistic and they're very meritocratic about meritocracy, right, on one side. But on the other side, they got free healthcare and HDB flats, which are, like, discounted like living units for most of the population. Mm -hmm. So isn't that interesting that neither party would be able to accomplish what Singapore did for their citizens because they they have such a mixed system. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just think that people in the future in America are going to need to like take a look at that. Like I know for example second thought he's more pushing like socialism. I don't know what that means like a French style or a Canadian style or French Canadian Montreal style or what you know what I mean the Swedish style. I don't know. I mean it, it would have to look different but I guess what I'm saying is I could see what he's saying to some extent because, listen, in the future, Andrew, do you think a decline looks more like Blade Runner, Ready Player One, or more like Judge Dredd? Or like, uh, you know how like there's so many futurist vision of the future and it's like, I don't know. I just think that instead of fighting each other, even though that's a human thing right now, people got to start thinking about what that future, what they want that future to look like mm. and trying to bring it there. Because right now, everybody's trying to either dial it back or dial it to this place where I don't even know if it makes any logical sense to try to bring America either. Whereas people got to kind of like go uh, partially accept like this new role, but we can, it doesn't mean just because America has less ability to absolutely project its power to every corner of the globe, it doesn't mean that America itself internally couldn't be better. Mm. But I think that that's what the, the whole point that people are missing is because people get so caught up in these, like the video game Age of Empires aspect of it. Right. Yeah, right. Because like there is such a difference between, I guess, the macro stats of a place and also like the internal lives day to day of its citizens. For example, Andrew, the USSR used to be an incredible world superpower. I don't know if anybody who grew up in USSR would ever tell you that the day to day was fun of being part of that machine. Right. Yeah. So anyway, guys, let us know what you guys think in the comment section below. We might do a video. Actually, we will do a video on why America is not an empire in decline. And maybe all these aspects that second thought brought up are, um, you know, overrated. Let us know what you guys think in the comment section below of the video. Until next time, we the Hot Pot Boys. We out. Peace. Peace.